What's your greatest, well, I'm f moment? Story one. I enlisted in the Marines because I wanted the challenge, not because I actually wanted a fight or anything. Naive, I know. While I was in the dental clinic waiting to get my wisdom teeth pulled, a handful of creeps crashed planes into the World Trade Center. Story two. Just a few days ago, it was my first time going rafting, and my group and I were about to get in the raft when all the instructors kept saying, wow, this is the roughest water I've seen in seven years. No biggie, let's go rafting, b We ended up being caught between two currents and flipping over. I was stuck under the raft for about two minutes until I was finally yanked out and dragged through the river until I hit a rock and climbed on top. The entire time, my only thought was, well, I guess this is how I die. Turns out a woman in my group actually did die. She hit her head underwater, passed out, and Story 3. This was when I was in 7th grade. I went to a really small Catholic school and my parents helped out around the school on weekends. So I was often there in an almost empty school with nothing to do really. I, for some reason, had a very different locker than most of the other kids in the school. Mine was really short, locker, but very wide. I had always wondered if I could fit inside of it. I figured this was a good time to do it with nobody around to see me finally solve this stupid ass mystery. So I got inside and I was kind of scrunched in there. Well, the goddamn door shut on me. I tried to use my fingers to open the latch from the inside, but I couldn't do it. So I locked myself inside my own damn locker until probably 20 minutes later when my dad and another adult family friend came along and I started pounding on the door. They laughed and laughed and laughed and laughed. And you know what? I'll just let you guys know when they're done laughing. But it's been 14 years, so I'm not sure that's going to be anytime soon. Story 4. As a little kid, I was traveling with my family on a plane to Dubai. Once it landed, I went down one aisle and my family went down the other. I didn't know and I thought my family was behind me. I kept walking forward and eventually when I looked back, they weren't there. Well, sh So I walked back and forth for what felt like an eternity in the airport trying to find them since I was lost in a foreign airport without my passport or identification was with my parents. Freaking out because there was a police person there and people kept looking at me funny since I was an unattended Asian kid freaking out. Eventually, I was reunited with my family, but man, it was terrifying as a kid. Story 5. It was probably February 2014 when the doctor told me that I had a brain tumor. Or October of that same year, three months after recovering from the surgery to remove it, when they told me that it not only grew back, but also grew back larger than these types are known for, and that it was going to kill me. It's easy to think that was enough to take me out, but it wasn't terminal. It was fatal if I did nothing, so I opted to have the surgery done again. And then it got a lot worse after that. I lost too much blood during brain surgery number two, which lasted 16 hours and had to have an emergency transfusion. Then I spiked a fever of 103 when I awoke, which wasn't going down and threatened to take me out. I was so out of it that I don't even remember enduring that ordeal, just the pain. Then the surgery and the tumor caused me to suffer from throat paralysis in such a way that I could no longer swallow food down my throat or keep it from going into my lungs. That meant I couldn't eat or drink. IVs kept me hydrated, but I couldn't have a peg tube for food surgically put into me because I had just finished major brain surgery and my body wouldn't be able to handle the additional stress of another surgery. The doctors told my father this and he burst into tears saying, They just killed my son. For the first time since I woke up from my operation, I sat up in bed, pointed to my father, and said, I'll live through this. And so it became a race. Could I heal up fast enough to get the surgery to have the feeding tube implanted in me before I starved to death? I went 14 days without food and lost 70 pounds. I now know what it means to starve. Of course, it didn't matter because they discovered the tumor was still growing once more. I would have to go through 30 days of intense radiation to try to stop it. This was on top of my physical therapy as I was too weak from losing all that weight and the radiation was also zapping my strength. When I finally finished, I was able to walk but could not get up from a seated position as my knees were too weak. It took me six months to get released back to work and I still live with the fear that it will come back. Oh, and if you think that this ended happily ever after, three months after I returned to my job of 11 years, the company filed for bankruptcy, shut down, and I was laid off. I've been struggling to find work, but people won't hire me as I work with computer support face-to-face, -face, and my facial paralysis has made a lot of people pass me over for interviews. But as bad as things are right now, as hard as things are right now, I still look at myself in the mirror and say, I'll live through this. Story 6. When I was around 15 years old, my parents discovered my non-Christian internet habits and installed a strict internet blocker. 
I didn't have access to YouTube again until I graduated high school. However, I found out that I could access the internet with my old flip phone from around 2003. I was surprised that I had internet at all, but all I could do was get Google image results since I couldn't visit websites or play videos. But about a week later, my father asked me about a $50 surcharge on one of our phones. Externally, I said nope, but internally, I panicked. It turned out there was a $1 charge every time I used the internet on that phone. My options were either to come clean or let them look into it and see the plethora of gay p searches I had done. That day was terrible for me. Story 7 About 8 years ago, my friend Drew flicked off a truck full of bros that was tailgating us. They followed us to a grocery store parking lot and got out to confront us, but I peeled out and started speeding down the road. Next thing I knew, I was in a full-on car chase. I turned off the main road, hoping I could lose them, but they cornered us in a cul-de-sac. All the bros got out of the truck and two of them had bats. I was pretty sure I was about to die. One dude came to the window and started screaming at me about how much of a p I was and how easily he could kill me. He made me tell him I was his b and I assured him that I was his b He made me say it about eight times. Then he bucked at me, turned around, got on his truck, and left. That was the scariest experience of my life, and to this day, I won't even honk at someone no matter what they do on the road. Story 8. Recently, I was moving home and job at the same time, and I was staying with my parents to make it easier to get to my new job. On the day I was moving, I opened a letter that had been in the flat, informing me that I owed city council 5,000 pounds. It turned out that a guy I had lived with for a few years had not been paying the bill, even though we had a deal that I paid for the internet and television, and he covered that. He hadn't paid a single penny in the years we lived together and lied to me numerous times. Not paying council tax is a crime, and my new job involved moving large amounts of money for people. I'd never been more stressed and furious in my life. Thankfully, my parents helped me sort it out, and I got my ex-friend to sign a contract saying he owed them the money, which they paid off. The council made sure that there would be no negative consequences for me, but I almost got set back five years and put into a debt that would have crippled me. He still goes around telling people that I am overreacting by being mad. Story 9. I was participating in a grenade training exercise in Afghanistan. My platoon had the day off, so our commander scheduled a big range for us to practice. We used many weapons that day, including frag grenades, AT4s, 50 cows, and barrettes. It was an exciting day because, as a standard infantryman, you don't get to use that stuff very often. The range had just started and our other squad got to start with AT4s, a rocket launcher for those who don't know. I was very jealous because my squad got stuck with grenades first, which is the most boring range of all those listed before. We started a line to start lobbing them over the HESCO barriers downrange and got to it. A guy in my squad, let's call him Smith, came up to the plate and readied his grenade. As he threw, the spoon on the grenade caught on his sleeve and hit the top of the barrier and fell straight down. Everyone yelled and took off, running back to the concrete safety trench about 30 feet behind us, everyone except me. I was next in line, so closest to the grenade, minus the guy throwing, and as I pivoted to run, I slipped and h no more than 10 to 15 away from the grenade. At that moment, I decided not to get back up and thought, well, I'm f***. When grenades explode, there is a cone of the explosion where a sliver above the ground does not get hit by shrapnel, and I just so happened to be in that protective cone. Those three seconds felt like a lifetime. The grenade went off and absolutely rocked the shit out of me. But somehow, I was unscathed. My squad leader came to check on me and rolled me over, yelling my name. As I rolled over, I just looked at him and said, Damn. I honestly was shaken up for only a minute and wanted to resume the range so I could shoot the big stuff. But since we had an accident, our range was shut down and we never got to go back the rest of the deployment. Story 10. While I used to make slightly altered driver's license, everything went smoothly for months, then 9-11 happened. No, I did not supply them with any ID. And they cracked down on Illinois and Iowa on it. Then one weekend, two different people in two different cities got caught with their real and my slightly altered ID. The cops wanted to know which was real, and when they both called me, that's when I knew I was f I got into the business because I wanted an ID, so I made one, and it was okay. Then I met a guy who made them in a slightly different way. We kind of took the best parts of both and combined them. Then our friends wanted them, and, well, $50 was $50. Then their friends wanted them, and it got out of control. I ended up making a deal that involved them being able to recover all the IDs. No one with one was charged besides the ones that got caught on their own. I made a plea and did not do any jail time. I was also a criminal justice major and ruined that whole thing. Good times. Story 11. I spent several years skydiving every weekend. On Jump 17, I was solo at this point but didn't yet have my license. Everything was going well. My canopy deployed and I started thinking about my landing pattern. I looked down and checked the windsock to make my choices. 
Once I was committed, I noticed people landing in the opposite direction of where I was going. You should land into the wind to slow your forward speed, and I wondered why they were doing it wrong. And then I realized, oh crap, this was the moment when I knew I was in trouble. Jump 17 is roughly equivalent to your second week of learning to drive. You can make things go where you want, but you don't have much experience. Someone has explained how to handle things, but you don't have a clue. So with the wind at my back, I looked down and realized I was moving very fast, a little faster than running speed. There was no way I could run this out, and even if I tried rolling on the landing, there would be a lot of momentum. I was going to wipe out, and this was my second I am screwed moment. I looked at the landing area and saw a sand pit. I said a short non-denominational prayer and headed for it at speed, performing my first awesome swoop and drilled myself into the sand. Thankfully, nothing was broken, but I was a little bruised. And that's when the safety officer started shouting at me. I was screwed. I didn't get grounded, but I was reamed out loudly and publicly, and again later at the club meeting. Story 12. It was a cold night and I was driving down a highway on a 20-mile stretch between my origin and destination. I had the window cracked as I was smoking and ashing out the tiny crack in the window. As I finished my cigarette, I went to flick it out the window when it bumped up against the window and fell into my door jam, which happened to be semi-full with papers. It immediately caught fire. I rolled the window down and started throwing flaming pieces of paper out the window. Mind you, this was an empty highway at about 4 a.m. I was watching the road ahead of me to make sure no cars were coming as I scrambled to throw the flaming pieces of scrap out my window. As you can guess by now, the police pulled me over. I'd been drinking that night, and I just knew I was going to be over the limit. It was definitely my worst, well, I'm screwed moment. But because of that moment, I am where I am today, and I stopped driving after drinking even a little. Things are pretty good all around. However, I would not recommend that experience. Story 13. I accidentally pinned my right foot under the rear tire of my lifted Jeep while my left foot was on the brake. I was stuck in a spread eagle stance, and I couldn't lift my leg over the door frame. I held onto the steering wheel for dear life while I struggled to squirm my right foot out of the shoe for about five minutes. I really thought I was going to be split in half. Story time. I was pressure washing my aunt's driveway, which had a slight decline down towards the street, and I needed to get something out of the back of my Jeep, which was lifted on 35-inch tires. I only needed to move it like three feet, and being six feet tall, I swung my left leg in there and put it on the brake as I bumped the shifter into neutral and went hop forward with my other leg. On my second hop, I was going to bump it back into park, but, well, the rear tire caught it as I was shifting it back into park before I got to hop. The short wheelbase got me. It rolled up almost to my ankle and was in as much of a split as I could tolerate without screaming. It was such a wide split that I couldn't even pull myself up by the steering wheel, but was only able to prevent myself from sinking and stretching it out even worse. So there I was, whimpering and sweating while I held myself up by the steering wheel as much as I could in the summertime Florida heat. There's about a 4-inch vertical rise between the floor pan and the door on a Wrangler, and I couldn't lift my leg over that, couldn't lift it at all. So I kept squirming my right foot out from under the tire. It felt like forever, and I don't remember if I got my foot out the shoe or pulled my shoe out from under the tire. Either way, I'm sure it would have been a sight. My aunt was actually home, but I also knew how stupid it was, and I didn't want her to know, and I still haven't told her or my dad. She was 75, and she would have needed a stepladder to get in there anyway. To picture it, imagine a split like Jean-Claude Van Damme tilted right at a 45-degree angle with his right foot under the back tire and his left foot reaching into the Jeep and on the brake. Story 14. Driving home late at night in my Mazda 3 hatchback, I was going across a six-lane dam when I got clipped head-on by a drunk woman in the Yukon. The airbag went off, which knocked my hands off the steering wheel but also saved my life from the impact. Thank you, Mazda. My Mazda then went into a spin, and as I'm spinning, I got my hands back on the wheel to turn into the spin. Around the 360-degree point, I decided I was in trouble. I knew the lake was flooded and assumed I was dead, but I continued to hold the wheel while spinning out of control. I ended up doing like a 1260-ish and stopped on the far lane on the edge of the dam. I let out the biggest sigh of my life, then proceeded to go into shock and lose my vision for the next hour. Story 15. Come on, let's drink it. Our older brother will go to the liquor store and replace it tomorrow. We drank the wine, got drunk, and had fun. The next day, our older brother called and said they couldn't find anything that looked like the bottle on the shelf. He asked me to read the label exactly as it said, and I read, Limited edition, specific year, card around the top says, To Mom and Dad, from Boss. Our older brother informed me that the clerk told him it was a 300 or 400 bottle of wine, limited edition, presented to my mother when she won an award. We replaced it with a $12 bottle of wine and hoped our parents wouldn't notice. Unfortunately, they did. Story 16. 
When I hit a patch of black ice and lost complete control of my car, everything I learned in driver's ed and everything my dad ever taught me just blanked out of my mind like a computer crashing. I just kind of sat back and thought, well, shoot. Before hitting the side of the road, flying through the air for 15 feet and rolling my car three times, it rolled from front to back at one point, busted out the windows and packed me in with snow so I was basically protected like packing peanuts. When I came to, I got out of the car without any harm done to me. The lady who stopped to help yelled out to me, Ma'am, are you okay? And I just shouted back, My dad is going to be so angry with me. My insurance is going to go up. Story 17. I was backpacking with a bunch of friends in the mountains and several days in, we set up camp by a large pristine lake. While everyone was sunning themselves and goofing off on the shore, I decided to swim to the other side of the lake. The water was cold, but I didn't think twice about it because swimming pools also seem cold when you first jump in. I got about a quarter of the way across when I realized that the lake was way colder than any swimming pool I'd been in and that the cold was sapping my strength, so I turned back. On the way back, I quickly got to the point where I no longer had the strength to do the crawl stroke, so I switched to the side stroke. When I no longer had the strength for that, I flipped over onto my back and tried to get to shore by just kicking and moving my hands back and forth. I finally got to the point where I couldn't even do that back thing and realized I was too weak to call out to my friends for help. At that point, I thought, well, I'm in trouble and sort of let my body sink to the bottom thinking that I was about to drown. What I didn't realize, because I was on my back, was that I was so close to shore that I was literally inches above the bottom, so I was able to crawl and stagger out of the lake. Story 18. In high school, my siblings and I were not allowed to leave campus to get lunch. Mom paid for school lunch, and that was the rule. This had to do with my older brother showing off to his friends the day he got his license by taking them out for fast food and coming back with a $160 speeding ticket. As a result, he lost many privileges and none of us were ever allowed off campus again. After weeks of peer pressure, I finally gave in. My friend and I jumped into our giant suburban. Mom had a 12-hour shift at the hospital. Dad was out of town for work and who would know? Plus, I really wanted some nuggets and a big and tasty. This baby was still on the dollar menu and I'd get five at a time. We left the school and made a couple of turns. At the first big intersection, we stopped. It was absolutely dead in our small town, but there was one car opposite us in the intersection. Oh, hey, mom. We made eye contact. She canceled her turn signal, drove straight, and pulled up alongside us. She had me roll down my window and said, we will talk at home before driving off. You guys are probably thinking of stories of death, dismemberment, and prison, but for a 16-year-old who got caught in a fluke incident and was about to lose a ton of privileges, I felt like I could handle it. Now I look back and it's silly and water under the bridge, but she knew I was in deep trouble too. She loved it. Well played, mom. Good game. Story 19. That exact moment when you realize you're leaning too far back in your chair and your life flashes before your eyes and you accept your fate.